All right, looks like we are ready to go. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to my photography masterclass. Terry White here, and I'm happy to be back, not only for my masterclass, which I love, it's the thing I look forward to every Friday, but I'm also back in my photography studio. Can't have a photography masterclass if we don't do a photo shoot every now and then. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and dive right into what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to be doing a, a product photo shoot. I was trying to think like, I'm so used to saying portrait, a product photo shoot uh, using flash. So we're going to be using um, speed lights or the, the kind of lights that you would typically put on top of your camera, which I always tell you don't do unless it's the last resort. And now we're going to... Um, show how to do this with products. Now, I'm a little bit, I'll admit, I'm a little bit outside of my element. I don't do a lot of product photography. I know the concepts, I know the rules, I know what to do, what not to do. Wouldn't definitely wouldn't say I'm an expert at product photography, but I, I kind of know what I'm doing. So hopefully we can get some good shots today. Um, and because of everything that's going on in the world, it's kind of, it's kind of a bit hard to do um, a bit hard to do uh, portrait sessions. So uh, let me know, Tim, if, if that's better. Let me turn it down a bit more. So Tim says my mic is peaking and I can control that. I can actually turn it down. So Tim, let me know if that's better. But anyway, and, and speaking of which, I am trying out, I'm always in the studio trying out new gear. So I'm trying out a new microphone and hadn't turned it to the right volume, apparently. So with that said, uh, I see a bunch of folks already in the chat. Hello, Andrea. Uh, hello, Michael Kent. Hello, Sean. Hello, J.R. Flores. Hello, Chris. Uh, Tim. Uh, Richard. Angelica. Great to see you all here. And I saw some names up there earlier. I think I said Sean. Fred's here. Mike's here. Uh, and everybody's here coming in from various platforms. So with that said, um, much better audio. Cool audio levels. Turned out. All right. Um, with that said, uh, if you're watching on another platform, if you're watching on, uh, I don't know if it went live on LinkedIn. I think I think I saw a little glitch there. But if you're watching on LinkedIn, if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on Twitter, that's great. You can hang out there and watch. But I can only see one chat today, and it's going to be the one over on Behance. So if you're hanging out on another platform, head over to B.net. So B E dot net dot slash adobe live so be dot net slash adobe live and that's where we'll actually see your questions and that's where we'll actually see the chat and that's where i can see your comments and 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 tim telling me to turn my mic down a little bit so <laughs> that's where everything's going to be happening today so let me give you guys a little bit of a tour of what's going on in the studio and then we'll start right into the photography itself uh, and I uh, see a Bake Like a Pro is here. Hey, man, it's been a long time. Um, Carolyn Brown's here. Great. And Jan's, or Jan's here as well. So with that said, uh, first and foremost, let me just give you guys a little peek at the studio. So this is what we're doing. We've got the classic wine, cheese, grapes. Some of that's real. Some of it's not. And then I've got a speed light on the left side and a speed light on my right side. And they're mounted in a soft box by Westcott. So that's Westcott's rapid box strip. So when you're doing product photography, a lot of times you want a, a light that's linear as opposed to round or as opposed to square. These kind of give a nice um, light from, from a product perspective standpoint. Now, it may look like my backdrop is lit. That's it. That is a backdrop, but it's actually just in front of a window. And even though the blinds are closed, it's pretty dark in here. But from the cameras for the live stream, you're actually seeing just the, the ambient light coming in from that window. So there is no light on the background whatsoever. We're going to try and get away with just these two lights. And we're going to even start off with no light. We're going to then do one light. And then we're just going to keep going until we get it the way we want. So that's the setup. Uh, from the from the photography standpoint or from the subject standpoint now uh, as far as my camera settings are concerned I get this question all the time hey are you shooting in manual yes unless you unless I tell you otherwise just assume it's manual 
Uh, now, I've got this already dialed in for a flash, which we're going to tweak it because, uh, and now you can actually see how dark that background really is. It's not as bright as what you saw. I'm using my uh, Nikon Z6. Um, hell, the clipping's back. Okay, I'll turn down some more. Probably because I was talking a little louder. All right, so I've got my uh, Nikon Z6. Oh, I see that over there. Hang on one more time. All right, let me know if that's better. I've got my Nikon Z6. I'm using a Nikon Z uh, F 1.8 lens on it. So I can get some nice shallow depth of field and we are gonna be at 1.8 most of the time. We may change it. Um, I'm using pocket wizard triggers. So there's a trigger on each flash and one on top of the camera. So three triggers, two lights and in the camera. I think that's it. <laughs> and now I'm also shooting tethered into Lightroom. So we're going to start with that and, and do that. Okay. Oh yeah, brand better. Everyone's loving the audio now. Yay. The new microphone's working out. Let's hope it keeps working out. Okay. Anyway, um, we're going to be shooting tethered into Lightroom. That's the Adobe tie into all of this. And I'm actually even using a new tethering cable. Um, I normally use tether tools. I'm not sponsored by any of these companies, but uh, this is a new company called Area 51 Tether Company, and they have active um, tethering cables, these long cables that go from your camera to your computer. And this one even has the ability, if you need more power, it's got a little micro USB port on it, so you can actually plug it in and get more power for longer runs of your cables. And um, I know what a lot of people are always interested in the gear. So I put together a gear guide. The only thing I didn't put in it is the pocket wizards, but luckily I did it in Adobe Spark. So I can go back and edit it after the class and add the pocket wizards in it. Well, let me go ahead and post that link in the chat so you guys can see all the equipment except for the pocket wizards, which I forgot to put in there until I just saw them or just saw them as I was going through the gear today. Oh, I got to log in. Oh, no. Am I not logged in? Hang on. Hang on, guys. It's going to make me log in for a minute. Bear with me. No, I, yeah, I know I already have an account. Let's sign in. There we go. Personal account. Uh, authenticator code for two-factor authentication. <laughs> Good times to be happening when we're live. Good times. All right, let's go look at that two-factor authentication code in my password app, that one-time code, which, no, 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 I actually need to see it. Let's type that in. It's 911911. Just kidding. It's not those numbers at all. There we go. And logging in. And now I'm logged in. I should be back to you. Cool. I'm back to the chat. And let's go ahead and paste that in now. There we go. Cool. Okay. So with that said, uh, there's the gear guide for, um, for all the gear that I'll be working with today. So people that just love gear, you can go check that out. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with the actual computer part of it. Then we'll get to the lights and then we'll go from there. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my desktop. I've got, um, these are the images from our last photography shoot where we did macro photography. And I'm going to go ahead and just go up to my file. Oh, wait, let's come down, go up to my file menu. If I can get to my file menu. There we go. Go to my file menu. Come down to Tether Capture. This is in Lightroom Classic, by the way. So there's two versions of Lightroom on the desktop. There's Lightroom Classic, and there's the one we just call Lightroom. Lightroom Classic has tethering, which means I can connect the long cable to my computer from the camera and shoot directly into the computer. Lightroom, unfortunately, does not have that feature yet. So when people say sometimes, well, why, why don't you use the other one sometimes? I do use it sometimes for these classes, but I can only use what is going to work for the class. In this case, Classic is the better, the better one. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, start Tether Capture. Then it's going to ask me 
uh, what do I want to name the shoot, i.e., what do I want to also name the photos? So I'm going to do product photography MC for master class. Which number do I want to start on? I want to start on number one, meaning what is going to name the files. So it's going to name them photography master class number one. It's also going to ask me where do I want to put them. I usually put them in my Dropbox folder temporarily so that I can um, access them from my other computers with Lightroom. All right, so with that said, I can also add them to a collection on the fly. So if I wanted to do that, I can go ahead and create that collection. And let's go ahead and, and create a collection. And we'll call the collection Wine and Cheese and other assorted things. If I needed to put it in a collection set, I could. If I needed to set it as the target collection, I could. And if this catalog were signed into Lightroom uh, on the cloud, I would also be able to sync these photos so they would be available on my other devices and available for me to share as a gallery. Uh, but we'll do that on another day. So let's go ahead and create that. And um, I'm using my metadata template, which puts my copyright information in there. And if I wanted to put any keywords in right now, I could do wine, I could do cheese, I could do product, product, whatever I want to possibly look these up with in, in the future. So we'll go ahead and click OK on that. That will then uh, look for my camera. It found it and it brought up the tethering bar. And you'll notice on the tethering bar at the very bottom of the screen, it shows me the camera that's currently connected, which you can now switch cameras. So if you got more than one camera plugged in, you can do that. You've also got um, the name of the shoot, and then you've got the camera settings. So you can actually see I'm at um, 1 200th of a second for flash. I'm at F 1.8. I'm at ISO 100. I could also switch my white balance. I would typically go with something like flash. <laughs> But I may not like it, so I may put it back to auto. And if there were any developed settings I wanted to happen uh, as the shots came in, I could do that on the fly as well. Now, if I just walk over and take a shot as is, and which, by the way, let me show you what that would look like. So with these settings, I've got one problem right off the bat. First problem is that, um, well, first of all, it's out of focus. So let's, let's try and focus on it. I can barely see that label because everything's so dark. You can even see it on my camera settings. Everything's so dark, um, I don't know what I'm gonna get. I, oh, I do know what I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get a very dark photo. So when I go ahead and, and choose that, I get basically a, a very dark photo and we can go full screen on that. And we can see that that's what I get just from the background light with these settings. So not a very flattering photo. It's, um, it's, it's paying more attention to the, to the background than it is anything else because that's the brightest spot in the photo. I am using autofocus. I can barely see the numbers on the bottom, 19, and this is what I would get just with the ambient light. Now, I knew that was not gonna be great. Why even start there? Because you wanna start with no lights so you can actually start to see what you're going to get when you start adding lights. So if you just turn on lights and you start shooting, unless you've set those up before, you have no idea what you're gonna get or what it's gonna look like until you actually do it. So um, it's best to start off light and build up the lighting so that you get, you know, you, you know what you're doing. In other words, you know why you're adding the light, you know why you're moving the light, you know why you're moving the subject, so forth and so on. So I'm going to walk over to the light on the left. We're going to start with, actually, I take that back. We're going to walk over to the light on the right. We're going to start with one light, turning it on, very low power, and because I have all the lights set to manual, and we're just going to uh, shoot with one light for now. All right, so let's go in. Now, not only do I have to turn on the light, but I also have to turn on the trigger. So I'm going to turn on the trigger first. And then I'm going to reach over and turn the light on. Now, keep in mind, we normally put a main light in front of the subject and shoot that way. But I am going to actually use a technique that's called a rim light. So I'm just going to basically wrap light around the subject. So with that one light on, and let's go ahead and turn the trigger on the camera as well. All right. 
put that one light on. Oh, and by the way, um, what, if, what if all I had was the ambient light? Let me, let, me, let me just stop there for a second. Let me turn the trigger back off. What could I do to better expose this photo? Well, I could bump up my ISO because I'm already at, I'm already wide open. So let's bump up the ISO to 800. And no flash, let's just take the same shot. And with ISO 800, I'm starting to see the subject. But again, because that window's lit in the back, because there's light coming from the sun, it's actually blowing the window out more. Now I can't control, the blinds are already closed. I can't control it anymore other than a gobo, a go between, something that would block it. So if I were really trying to do this with ambient light, I would just stick anything, a curtain, piece of cardboard, whatever it would take to block that sun from coming in. So I'm just getting the ambient light from the room. But we're not gonna worry about that because we do have flash. So let's go ahead and put the ISO back down to uh, 100 or 200 or so. Let's go 100. And now let's uh, turn the trigger on on the camera. It's already on on the flash. Now let's take that one shot. I saw the flash go off and I'm starting to get that light coming in. So again, that light coming in from the background is still a little distracting to me only because a brick wall wouldn't have, well, it could have lines of light going through it if the window were on the other side, <laughs> but I know I'm getting those lines of light because there's a window <laughs> there behind that backdrop. Now there's also um, seamless paper on rolls above the, um, above the backdrop. I could even lower a piece of paper down below and that would also block a lot of that light. I'm not gonna worry about it today, but just know that if you were trying, like if you were trying to shoot against a light like this, you really want to tone it down as much as possible. So uh, I'm not going to work, walk over there and try and disturb that right now. And hopefully the sun might go between a cloud between now and the top of the hour. But let's just work with our light that we have now. So so far so good. I like that. Um, I like what I'm getting so far. But let's go ahead and make some adjustments. Let's say if we bring that light around to the front. So it's just a speed light, a very inexpensive speed light. And we're just put, we put it in a soft box. We're using a wireless trigger. And I'm just going to go ahead and take the shot right now and see what I get. All right. So just bringing that light around, making it more of a main light is giving me what I want as well. So I'm starting to light the foreground more. I'm starting to get that nice reflection on the bottle. I'm getting more of what I'm looking for. But since I do have two lights, I actually want to use them. I actually want to take advantage of both lights. So with that, yeah, uh, thanks for the background. Uh, looks nice. I, I bought that specifically for my Zoom and, and Skype and Blue Jeans call. So that's what that background is really for. All right, but anyway, before we move it to the side again and use the second light, let's bring it around more to the front and see what happens. All right. And, oh, and the light's in the way, so let's move it back a little. This is why tethering is so cool, because you get to see your results instantly. You don't have to wait and download a card to the computer. All right, and I would now, I can start to see stuff on the table over there to the right. So I might recompose a little bit more. I just move the camera over a little. Let me move my focus point back to the bottle. And let's try it again. There we go. So now we're getting we're getting a pretty decent a pretty decent subject, pretty decently lit with this one light and this one soft box making it nice and soft. Now, as far as the the light itself, it's on it's all the way down to 132 of a 132nd of a of power. So it's not one to one, it's not one quarter power, it's not one eighth power, it's one thirty second power. So that's almost at its, I think that is its lowest setting or almost at its lowest setting. Uh, so it's just giving very little at light output because you don't need a ton of light all the time. So we th always think of lights and big flashes and a lot of light, you don't always need that. All right. Um, is this HSS or does the Z6 go up to one two hundredth of a second? It is not high-speed sync. 
Yes, the Z6 does go to one two hundredth of a second. It'll go even higher. It's, it's, it's not the Z6, it's the, the flash. So most flashes, just standard flashes, top out at about one two hundred fiftieth of a second before you start to need high speed sync. Good question though. All right, let's put it back. And now let's introduce a second light. So we're just gonna walk over and do the exact same thing. I'm gonna turn on the trigger, which is all set to the same channel. I'm going to turn on the light itself, which is also not at the right power. Let's go ahead and bring it down to 1 32nd of a, 1 132, 1 32nd of, of, of power. And now that I got both lights on, both triggers on, and both lights in position, let's go ahead and take that shot. Because what I really want is I want that, I want that. <laughs> I want that reflection on both sides, not necessarily blocking the, um, the label. I, you know, I don't want the light to obscure the label. I kind of want it to wrap around the sides. Uh, so let's take one more. Again, it should look the same. That's the thing about product photography. It's not going to vary a lot if you don't move anything, but there we go. And also you kind of saw the, the color change a little bit right after it did, uh, right after it took that shot, that was the white balance kicking in. So that was the flash white balance, which is warming this photo up um, based on the white balance that I chose. All right, uh, Jan says, I know nothing about flash, so this is very useful to me. Well, cool, that's why we do these master classes is because we learn, you learn, we teach, you learn, <laughs> um, and we, we kind of experiment, and we get an hour each Friday to kind of experiment with new techniques and new ideas and hopefully expose you to some as well. Now, again, I'm loving this. This is great, but if I, now I'm gonna start being critical. If I really, really, really want to make an adjustment here, it would just be a minor adjustment. I like the two lights on the side. I like the amount of light, again, but they're a little too close to the front. They're just starting to obscure that four. So what I wanna do, I could either move the lights back a little, or I could bring the product closer. Either one's gonna do the same thing. So we can, uh, since this is all on a table on a, on a little platter, I can maybe bring this for actually I'll bring it forward a little just to see what I get. And if need be, I'll um, move the lights back a little. All right, here we go. Nope. I, I liked it back further where it was. So it's time to move the lights back. So let's put this back in position. I could move the camera back too, but let's put this back in position and let's move the lights. We can either turn them or move them. Uh, so we can move them back a little, just over to the right a little bit. So now we're starting to feather the light. The light won't be dead on center of the bottles or in the bottle. I have some obstruction here in the way of my light stand. Let's go ahead and move that. All right, so we just moved the lights back a little bit. We kind of put the, the subject back in, back in position where it was. All right, let's take that shot. Getting there. Uh, hang on a minute. Let me move just a little to the right. Getting there, okay, now I'm gonna do a little bit of both. I'm going to turn, I'm gonna leave the light in position and just turn it slightly. Try not to knock down this other bottle here. Right, I'm gonna take these bottles down off the table because now they'll start blocking light or reflecting light. All right, we have some other products to shoot. So just move it, just turn the light a little bit away from the bottle. So again, turning the light a little bit away from the bottle, just a hair, and let's see what we get. Not much different. Not 
Now, the, the downside to doing that is I'm starting to lose the detail in the 19, what is that, 1924, because the light's moving away from the front of it. So, what do we do? We bring the light back up to the front a little bit more, but we still turn it. Or maybe just on the one side. That was the only side that I was seeing a problem, but let's see. They don't have to necessarily be at the exact same angle unless you want them exactly the same highlights on both sides. Yeah, now the two four is coming back and the four is not being obstructed as much. So we're getting there. We're kind of dialed in to where we want to be. Now, the other thing you might notice is that when you look in the camera settings, um, it, that you can't even see the bottle because there is no light. There is no modeling light. There is nothing lighting the front of the bottle. So you might actually run into an issue where you can't autofocus on it because the camera can't see anything on the bottle. It can't see the label because the bottle is so dark without a flash. So I've got just an LED light over here. And if I turn it on to minimum lowest power, it should not adversely affect the photo. So I'm just going to turn it on just so you can see the difference. This is just an LED light. You can use any light to do this because all you're doing is just giving it enough light so that your camera can see something. And here, let me, uh, still not, not to totally bright, but let's go ahead and move it over a little. And let's move it down a little. Let's lower it. There we go. I can start to see that light on it now. Yeah, there we go. If I move the um, focus point out of the way, you can now see the 1924 on the label because there's just a little bit of light on it for the camera, the camera to focus on. So if you run into a problem where you're having a problem with it focusing on the background, focusing on the foreground, focusing on the background, it's because it can't see the subject. So just give it enough light to where it can see the subject and away you'll go. Okay, um, time to change it up a little because <laughs> just when we dial it in. So you, you get your shots, you get what you want, but we're not gonna, we're not, I'm not gonna do what I normally do, which is shoot the same thing, the exact same thing for an hour and end up with 100 frames of the exact same thing. So I've learned my lesson. Time to switch it up. Time to turn it. Put the cheese more in the foreground, turn the bottle around, move the bottle forward a little bit, take, uh, take the grapes, wrap them around the other side, introduce some other color grapes, some red ones in this case. And I did, I did, I did the cardinal sin. I did the thing I was going to tell you not to do. When you're working with product photography, you definitely don't want to touch the product with your bare hands <laughs> because you're going to leave fingerprints. You're going to smudge something. You're going to put grease on it. You're going to put a mark on it and you're going to say to yourself, I'll get that out in Photoshop. No, it's going to take forever to do it on every single photo. So if you're really doing product photography, that's why I put these here as a reminder. The, um, you definitely want to use gloves. So I have white gloves. They don't have to be white. <laughs> they just have to be something that's not going to leave fingerprints or grease. And then if you put a glove on as you're moving your product, you're not going to introduce anything new. So clean everything before you start with product photography. Because those little smudges, those little fingerprints, those little everythings you, you touch it with and do are going to leave fingerprints, leave marks. And you're going to hate it because you're going to have to be spending all that time trying to get rid of it in post. All right, so let's uh, move that focus point over and down a little bit. Let's try this. Yeah, now we're changing things up a bit. And I'm liking it. I might do one more thing since I got my white glove on. I might turn that cheese. Right, 
Let's try that. Oh, you're not seeing the product. Hang on, let's get you get you to where you can see it. You're not seeing these amazing shots. All right, let's, so here was the one before. Where the cheese, oh, that's before, before, and that is after. All right, so we're getting there. All right. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right. So keep going. What else can we do? Because, again, unlike a portrait, there are not going to be any changes in emotions and expressions and hair and wardrobe and all those things. So when it comes to products, once you take it, once you got all the frames you need, you, you, you got all the frames you need. Like there's nothing going to, if I, I can snap that shutter now 10 more times, I'm going to get 10 of the exact same thing. So take a few, change it. Take a few, change it. Take a few, change it. That way you're giving your customer, your client, your, your portfolio, whatever you're shooting this for, opportunity to have a selection of different things. All right, those red grapes make, uh, those red grapes make such a big difference. Can you raise the shutter speed to darken the background? I can, I can go to 250, so let's do that. All right, let's try that. If you go much higher than that, and depending on the flash, you might get clipping. It darkened it a little bit. And now let me show you what that clipping would look like if you went too far. So that's 1 3 20th. See that dark shade at the bottom? That's when you get that and you're saying, what's creating that dark spot at the bottom or the top of your frame or whatever? It's because your shutter speed is too high for. The, the, the speed lights or lights or strobes you're using. That's where I think Sean asked earlier about high speed sync. High speed sync, if your lights, camera, and all that supports it, then you can get around that. You can get around being able to shoot at a higher shutter speed and without getting that clipping. So I'm gonna take it back down to two, 1 250th, which is where I said that clipping would, that's as high as we can go without getting that dark shadow, that dark clipping. And that, so as, that's as high as my shutter speed is going to go with these lights without switching all the way over to high speed sync, which is a whole different setup. Okay, that dark shade at the bottom is very dramatic. Yeah, but that's an accident. <laughs> it shouldn't be there. Uh, okay, so we can also introduce, especially if you're going to work with glass gloves, and also introduce a wine glass. So, oh, and keep in mind... That glass is going to be lit. Don't want to block the product. And you would probably, in a real product shoot, pour wine into it. There we go. That looked good. Try it on the other side. We would again really put some dark liquid in there or the wine itself in there if we had another bottle, and we would do that. I like that reflection on the glass a lot. Now imagine, just imagine if it actually had wine in it, <laughs> how cool that would look. Because then you wouldn't be seeing the background through it, you would actually be seeing the wine in it. All right, uh, so we, we kind of got that one going. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to swap to a different bottle. So let me uh, grab a, a champagne bottle down here. Same thing, I got my gloves on, so I'm not introducing any fingerprints. And we're going to re just remove that one out of the way and put this one in its place. And we're going to move the red grapes because the label is further down on the bottle. We don't want to obstruct the... Uh, <laughs> the label any more than we have to so we kind of clear it clear the way for it to get it out of the way all right uh, would you use real wine I would I you know you want the product because if you're shoot like I couldn't tell the difference 
but the client really might be able to tell the difference in the color of the liquid. So if you don't get the liquid just right, <laughs> if you're using something else, if you get the wrong color, they might complain about that. So you would always have them send a couple versions of the product, one so you could open it if you needed to, to use it. Yeah, that's looking awesome. All right, and the sun's going away a little bit, so I'm not getting as much light from that background as I was getting before. Apple juice, yeah, again, any, any brown or red or burgundy liquid would, not brown, <laughs> but burgundy liquid would work. But you just wanna make sure it's gonna be the same color as the, as the product so that the client won't say, hey, that's not really our wine color. Uh, plus, uh, nothing looks like wine. You, you, can fake, you can fake wine in movies and you can see fake wine in movies and shows when it's, real, when it's really light and see-through. Grape juice will work better. Okay, again, if it were me, you guys are all giving great suggestions. Use the real product <laughs> if you can because then there's no guesswork. There's no, will it look right? It is the wine, it is the champagne, it is the whatever. It will look right because it's the real thing. Now, that is, that, but that brings up an interesting point because in food photography, they don't use the real product all the time. That hamburger you're seeing on that commercial has got all kinds of stuff in it that's not food. It's got paste <laughs> for the mayonnaise. It's got all kinds of stuff to make it look juicy and real. So it depends on what the product is for or who's the product for. But in the case of wine, so I wouldn't get the color wrong, I would actually use their wine. I would actually use their, their champagne. Okay, let's keep going. Let's turn it just a little bit. Let's put the wine, or the cheese, I should say, like this. And let's take that shot. I like that one even better. We can also move the glass over. And like I said, in the real world, I would have a second bottle that I open and pour into that glass. Yeah, there we go. Now again, imagine if you will, your grape juice, your apple cider, your, your real wine in that glass to give you that real effect. Okay, now notice the nice reflection on the, on the darker grapes. What if we introduced a little water? We have a mister, a misty spray thingy, and I'm gonna move the glass out of the way because I don't wanna get any on the glass yet. And we're just gonna spray a little misty water on those grapes and on these grapes. Just wet them. Hell, I can already see the difference. Yeah, baby. All right, put that back. Let's go ahead and take it. Can I see it? Let's see. I can almost see it on the, on the bottle. Yeah, I can see it, not enough, but I kind of like the idea if it's actually on the bottle. That even looks cooler. All right, I'm spraying just one side of the bottle. Let's play with water. Oh, I'm loving the water on that. I'm not getting it as much on the grapes. Maybe if I increase the power of the flash, I would. So let's increase the power on this one side. Just, just take it up a, a little. So I'm just going to take the power up. It was on 132. I'm going to take it up to 1 16th. So just took the power on that one side up a little on the flash. 
And it definitely got brighter. Not in a good way. <laughs> yeah, because see, now the light's uneven. You can definitely see that, that just that little bit of power, you can see it got brighter on that one side. So we can either take it back down, move the light back, turn the light more. Any of those ways will alter the way that's gonna look. So let's just simply turn the light a little more away from it. I can't go too far because it's already turned quite far away from it. We're gonna lose it completely. And that technique is called feathering the light, where instead of pointing the light straight on, you're just turning the light away from the subject a little. That's not bad. So I kept the power the same. I just turned it a little. Let me turn it a little bit more. See what happens. Just turned it ever so slightly, a little bit more away from the product. Yeah, okay, so now it's even back out, but it's brighter. So that's actually the sweet spot. Okay, everyone's saying it's too high. What's, what's too high? Be, let me know, I, I missed that. The condensation is so dramatic, totally sells it, great. Ashi, thanks. Let's add some more. <laughs> can never have too much condensation when it's working. I, I, I take that back, you can. But since we're lighting that side a little bit more, let's add a little bit more water to it. All right, Sean, what's too high? Yeah, now there's more water in the front of it as well. And that is working for this. All right, I'm loving that. Okay, so now that we got the look of it just right, we can go ahead and swap out some of the products. Because we kind of photographed all this stuff to death. We have more things we can introduce. We have um, this bread. And we have, let me put my other glove on. Because I'm going to be using both hands. So another white glove. Isn't it nice to wear gloves, not for a health reason for a change? All right, <laughs> anyway. Uh, we have um, some sliced, these are real sliced sausage. So not gonna eat them, but definitely gonna put them here and make it part of the shoot. All right. There we go. Then I also saw we have this goat cheese product. So we can kind of put that goat cheese there. Vermont goat cheese. We put our little serving knife there. And let's give that a shot. So just so you know what that looks like, that's what it's looking like so far. All right. Um, Steve, Steven's asking, hey, that looks awesome. What camera are you using? Uh, Steven, I kind of covered all that up front with, but just so I can answer you right off the top, I'm using my uh, Nikon Z6 or Nikon Z6. And Steven, there's the gear guide of everything I'm using. It says Gi, but it should say gear. <laughs> with an 85 millimeter 1.8, right. All right, so there, there's your gear guide in case you want to, to know. All right. Oh, I clicked on my little thingy here. Let's go back to the shots. All right, let's take, uh, let's take another one. Now that we change what the product focus is, Okay, let's take this one. Now, the, um, the, if you're talking about this, the camera's a little high, now I'm starting to not like it on the, uh, the, the stuff we just added. So, I'm going to lower the camera ever so slightly. 
I'm not going to tilt it down, I'm going to lower it. So one thing in product photography, in addition to making sure everything's clean, you don't want to shoot, you don't want to shoot down on the product. You want to shoot it level. So if the camera's too high from the subject, don't tilt the camera down and point it at the subject, bring the camera down so they're at the same level. All right, here we go. Now, with that shallow depth of field of f1.8, if I focus on the cheese, it puts the water, or I'm sorry, the wine out of focus. If I focus on the wine, it's going to put the cheese out of focus. So, if both are important and both need to be in focus, what do we need to do? We need to up our aperture. So f1.8 is too shallow. It's going to keep one thing in focus, whichever one you want, but only one. If you want more things in focus, you got to go higher or less wide open than f1.8. So Davidson's asking the same kind of question we kind of started with all this. Um, what's the light setup? Two speed lights from Young Newell and two soft boxes from Westcott and using uh, triggers from Pocket Wizard. Okay, so let's, uh, let's up, up, up our f-stop a little. That will also darken things. Uh, so let's go ahead and up the f-stop to f, let's do f2.8. And so now I'm focused on the bottle. And like I said, it would make things darker. And it's still not bringing into focus enough. So let's go higher. Let's go F3 or F4. All right, I can start to see that pepper, peppermint, or pepper, Vermont, Vermont cheese. Let's go F4, 5. Now, why is it getting darker? Because you're closing that aperture. You're letting less light in, but you're getting, you're getting more of the product. All you notice the background is no longer out of focus. What about two glasses? Absolutely. If I had a second one, I would put it in there. <laughs> so now we're going to up the power a little. Or you know what? We could, first of all, we could drop our f-stop a little. Not our f-stop, our um, shutter speed. Let's see what this does. I don't think it's going to make that big of a difference. Yeah, it did make enough difference. It's, it's affecting the background, but not, not the foreground. So what's affecting the foreground is the actual lights. So let's go ahead and bring the, the power up on the light. I'm going to go from 1 16th power to 1 8th power on both lights. All right, now both lights have been, power's been increased. And let's go ahead, we got like six minutes left. Let's go ahead and shoot that. And there we go. So now we're starting to bring everything back. And we can see, we can read the label on the cheese, although it's just not positioned very well. Let's go ahead and turn it down a little bit more. Put a piece of bread under it to stable it. There we go. And let's try that. Yeah, we can read it, and then now it's blocking the other the wine, the champagne label. So let's move it back. And, you know, I would probably cut off the ends of it because they're, they're just paper curling down. So I would just take liberty and cut that off a little bit, trim it. Okay, we can see the rest of our label now. And now we can see the text for both in, in focus. Yep, getting there. 
Okay, and again, uh, I would never go with those lines coming through the background, so I would actually put something behind that so that we would just see the bricks and not the sunlight coming in. So if I were, if I were serious about this, this photo shoot, I couldn't have those white lines coming in from the background. All right, so I think we, need, we can use a little bit more condensation. And we can go ahead and introduce, we have a peach. Maybe put that there. It is whatever you want to make of it. Yeah, I like the way that's, that's catching that light on the left side. One thing I might try is now that we have that to base it on, I might turn the serving knife a little bit more. See what we get now. I like the serving knife turned because it's not as reflective. I'm digging this. Oh, and the lights, the lines went away. Yay, we got clouds. <laughs> the lines went away. Okay. Um, looking good. Hey, Paco, how's it going? And we are doing, oh, wait, what's that little, okay. See that little line, a green line sticking out from the peach? That's actually the leaf of the grape. But since you can't see it, it would be a thing I would have to take out in Photoshop. So whatever you can correct in camera, correct in camera. Like just, just rearrange things so you don't have that little distraction sticking out that you would then have to go edit out in Photoshop. There we go. No more little line. And I might bring the champagne bottle forward just a little. Like that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jan. Thank you, Victoria. By the way, I have to give Victoria credit. She styled a lot of this. These are a lot of the things she put on this table for me to use all came from Victoria's creative brain. So thank you, Victoria, for your initial styling and going out and getting the right products for this shoot. All right. Set the whole thing up on an old barn and a strong natural light and you're selling it. I'm going to sell it the way it is. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to sell it. All right, so again, I'm just taking frames of the same frame, so change it up a bit. Maybe uh, turn the cheese this one last way, this one last time. Move the Vermont uh, goat cheese or whatever that is over a bit. And one more. Oh, no, don't like it. And it might be time to turn this light a little bit more so that we, or move it a little bit more, so that we get some more light on the front of that uh, Vermont cheese. And Victoria could absolutely build this all in fresco. Yeah, you just get a whole different feel, just moving the light a half inch over. So amazing what you can do with just a couple of inexpensive and I would dare say cheap speed lights. The soft boxes, you kind of want them because you see what they do. They give you that nice linear light down the sides. Um, but you don't need a lot, you don't need a ton of, of expensive gear to do this. Like uh, Nikon and Canon speed lights, 300, 400, 500 dollars a piece on up. My strobes are about almost that price. They're like a little bit more than that. So why go with those super expensive speed lights? I have nothing against them. They're awesome. I have one, have a couple, but I've learned that you don't always need to spend a ton of money to get good results. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for joining me for my masterclass here today. Um, maybe I'll post one of these shots on Twitter or Instagram or something so you guys can see what we did and examine it more. Don't forget to take a look at the gear guide. 
We'll post that in the chat one more time. It is a Spark page. So I learned my lesson from last time and, <laughs> and did not try and post all the individual links. I'll add the pocket wizards to it, um, but that's about it. We are good to go. So that's the gear guide. Um, that's what we did today. We look at the studio setting one last time. There's a studio and that's all we did. Two lights and we just kept changing product and we had a spray bottle for the water and we used white gloves so that we wouldn't leave fingerprints and we shot level at the product and we t turned our lights so they're not dead on. So we create that nice reflect our nice side lights or rim lights on both sides. All right. That's it. That's my time. I want to thank everybody for being here and I'm out. I'm out. Have a good weekend. We'll see you later. And up next is the Photoshop daily creative challenge. Bye everybody.